The broader threat to newspapers is simply survival. For most of the 20th century, the Irish press was a cornerstone of the Irish media landscape. I was a cub reporter in the Irish press back in those days and remember well the internal battles being fought in Burkey. And many a story was written right here within the wood panelled walls of Mulligan's Bar. Oh, and paint a picture of the press when you were there. The Irish press was basically operated by a small group of creative people and a small group of people who were very, very good at getting the paper out, at identifying the story, following their instinct at a time when broadcast wasn't where people looked for the news. The Irish press was the place to be. The Irish press, I think by sort of common agreement, had the best atmosphere of any uh, newspaper in the city. And the newsroom itself physically was fantastic. The Burkey newsroom was like a throwback to something and you'd seen an American B-movie of the 30s, one of these vast rooms which when a big story was happening was just a, a kind of riot of, of activity and roaring and shouting, people running around the place. For newspapers, the back page is as important as the front. Irish readers love sports reporting and the doyen of all sports journalists was the late Con Houlihan, a master craftsman of the written word. He was one of those people who did a very rare thing, particularly for a sports journalist, which lots of people like to dismiss as the toy department in the newspaper. But Con brought such a kind of literary flair and such a wide palette of interests in, in the world at large, uh, never mind what's confined between the white lines of a pitch, that he drew people in who had, had little or no interest in sport just because his column was such a, a, a fantastic reading. People were buying the press. There were a large number of people buying the press solely to read Con. I mean, when you look at someone like Con Houlihan, you're, you're talking about someone who was ahead of their time and you can't just look at him versus journalism now because it's come on a lot. Um, you have to look at the people who were writing around him and what they were writing and in, in that sense it, it was revolutionary because a lot of the journalism going around at the time was, was, was very bland and, and very dull whereas Con was a, a poet of sorts, no? The very first away match I ever did for the Sunday Press was at Wembley. Uh, and was a big European qualifier, Ireland against England in 1991. I was sitting in the press box and Con was a couple of seats to my left and uh, just in front of him doing kind of co-commentary for a radio station was the legendary England uh, captain, former captain Bobby Moore, the man who lifted the World Cup in 1966, one of the games, one of the world games, most iconic figures. And before kickoff, I noticed an Irish supporter making his way up the aisle beside the press box with a match programme. And I saw him frantically trying to stretch in, and uh, I assumed he was handing it to Bobby Moore to get Bobby Moore's signature, but not a bit of it. He pushed past Bobby Moore so that Moore had to lean back in his seat so that this guy could give his match programme to Con Houlihan to sign. Long before computers took over, words were fashioned from hot metal. Newspaper printing was a craft. Each word had to be selected and composed. Printers, uh, they drank on this side of the house. Journalists drank on the back, on the other side of the house. It was their job to bring newspapers out. They had the power to do so because it took so long to train a printer, they could actually make very big demands. So when journalists started coming, printers looked down their nose at them. Yeah, I'm a real printer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 40,000 copies an hour. Uh, web offset printers do things quicker. Freddie Snow worked for the Irish Times in the days when it was printed under the newsroom in Dublin's Delir Street. What was nice about Delir Street was the press was downstairs in the basement and big press three stories high. And you had the offices upstairs, then you had the case room, you had the editorial above that. But you could actually, the building was alive, you could actually feel when the press was running. Yeah. And you could smell the, the, the ink like you know, on the knives going through it. The Irish Times successfully made the transition from the labour-intensive print methods to the new systems. However, with this change came widespread redundancies. In 1986, I was offered a job in the Irish Times. They were going to the new technology to uh, colour lithographic printing. With the new technology, because it was electronic, you had one person to do that, rather than a few people going over and making adjustments here, there and everywhere. It had to be controlled by one person. That was difficult, that was hard. Newspapers were being dragged into the computer age, but the Irish press in Burkey was being left behind. The Times and indeed the Indo, it was the world of um, U2 and of Riverdance, whereas back in the Irish press, uh, we marched to the sound of the Kilfenora Cayley Band. 
They had terrific journalists, some of the best journalists. Uh, their reports were watertight, well written, all the rest, but it looked interminably dull. We were printing on letterpress. Colour was very expensive to produce, and we needed to address the total modernisation of the Irish press. That was a saga of the entire uh, 1980s. There was very limited cooperation from the unions. From my experience of guys that worked there or whatever, they didn't trust the management whatsoever. The debt wounds were really inflicted by uh, managing to be the only um, national group to use, introduce new technology at the expense of a strike. It'd be very, very hard to imagine in the 70s when I started writing that a craft, and it was a craft, that had remained unchanged since the days of William Caxton was going to be wiped out. All of this cocktail, it uh, more or less exploded in the early summer of 1995. It was to take a critical newspaper article written by an Irish press journalist for the rival Irish Times that would lead to a sacking and then a strike. The decision was taken um, to kind of down tools. And part of that straight away was a decision to produce, I suppose what you'd call a strike paper. And then we sold the Express around the city. I and mean, then Con Hulan, on the very first day, went out and sold it on O'Connell Bridge. But then feared he'd get pneumonia or something in this bad weather. So came up with selling the Express in a pub. And of course, the people came to Con. He didn't have to go in search of the business. And there was an occupation uh, of the Burkey building, which I became part of. We worked in there and we slept there with people on the outside sending us in food and, dare I say, a drink. Among those lending support tonight was the champion boxer Stephen Collins and comedian Brendan Carroll. The Irish soccer team arrived with Jack Charlton. He said, how long have you been here? And I said, well, I've been here about five years. He went, five fucking years? Of course, he, was, uh, he, he watched how uh, long we'd been occupying the building. For him, a cigar, a cup of whiskey, and his own opinion of journalists. They're a necessary <laughs> evil. <laughs> but we like some of them. Once publication stopped, there was no commercial means of, of continuing forward. The unions asked to meet me, I met them, and, they were, and I got the impression that they would have agreed to anything. But there was nothing I could offer them. Commercially, they had killed it. I would have been very optimistic that if anybody had got their hands on those three titles, one of them underperforming massively, the Irish press, but the evening press still performing very highly, the Sunday press still a leading Sunday newspaper, 24% of the national newspaper market. If someone else had got their hands on those three titles, it could have continued and it could still be around today.